Welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today's seminar is by Dr. Christine Gabriel, and she will be continuing with a discussion of nightside magnetospheric dynamics. So Christine got into the field of space physics thanks to substorms, which she will be talking about today. She began studying them as an undergrad at Florida Institute of Technology before moving to UCLA to study them using the Themis mission. With the Themis mission, she contributed to the onset timing debate before focusing on substorm injections for her PhD work, which she studied statistically throughout the plasma sheet in order to inform her modeling efforts of mesoscale injections and how they are able to transport injections large distances thanks to the local dipolarization peak. Always being interested in magnetosphere and atmosphere coupling, she later characterized mesoscale convection flows across the polar cap in a roll oval using SuperDarn, and now works at the Aerospace Corporation using Themis Allsky imagers to study precipitation and conductivity by day, and the Van Allen probes to study the radiation belt environment by night. Christine is also a member of the MMS EPD team and an instrument PI for the GTOSAT small satellite mission. She also enjoys coordinating GEM focus group activities on dipolarization and has a current focus group looking at dipolarizations and mesoscale injections with GEM. With that, Christine, if you would like to start your presentation. Sure, thanks a lot, Kyle. <clears throat> So yes, the title of this presentation, as you can see, is Convection and Substorm. And a major theme, I think, of this talk is so much cool stuff and so little time. Uh, so when, when Kyle and David asked me to give this talk, they said it will be the beginning of the series transitioning to the night side. So an overview of convection and substorms would be great. So this talk will try and help us transition from the day side to the night side. And I can say that there's a lot more material on convection that I'm going to cover here and a lot more material on substorms. So what I tried to do to fit this talk into an hour is to look at each through the lens of the other. So in other words, I'll focus on convection as it more relates to substorms, although I will give a bit of a broad overview in the beginning. And I'll focus on substorms more as it has to do with convection. And the great thing is, if you tune in next week, Joachim Byrne will be giving another talk on the magnetotail and substorm specifically. So hopefully after today's broad talk, you'll get some more detail in the coming week. Uh, we were also asked to make these talks accessible to the graduate student level. So my goal in this talk is to make convection and substorms concepts accessible to graduate student audience, but I'll be using some more recent studies as the examples to update and promote discussion amongst all career levels. So we will start with some introductory material, some definitions and broad overview, uh, especially since this is the end of August and we might be having some new graduate students join us. I did want to start at a somewhat basic level to hopefully help them uh, follow along, not just with my talk, but with subsequent talks. So we'll begin with the Dungy cycle, what I call particle motion light, because I obviously don't have time to derive all the particle equations of motion, but I did want to touch on it in order to help uh, students to follow this convection um, story. We'll talk about convection on large scales. We'll talk about convection on mesoscales and specifically convection in substorms, which does tend to be more on the mesoscale. And we'll go into definitions. All right, <clears throat> so moving on. You cannot talk about convection without talking about the Dungy cycle. And first we should also talk about what is convection and define that. And often when we're talking about convection, we're talking about magnetic flux transport. Uh, in case anyone doesn't know what magnetic flux is, we have this equation here, but you can essentially think about it as the amount of magnetic field that's perpendicular to some area. So the Dungy cycle, which has thousands of citations in our field, 
I don't know if you guys know this, it's actually less than two pages long. It has two figures. And this is one of those figures, the main one that we often think about when we talk about the Denji cycle. And so in a nutshell, what happens is you have uh, the sun's magnetic field and that magnetic field can point in any direction. It can point southward as in this picture, it can point northward, which is in the opposite direction. It can have some angle in the Y direction, but when it's pointing southward, it's pointing in the opposite direction that Earth's dipole magnetic field points, which is pointing northward. And when it points in that direction, you can have day side reconnection, which uh, I believe Ying Zhou talked about a little bit in her talk earlier in this series. And we'll also have a talk in late October on reconnection specifically. So I'll let uh, others talk about that feature. But suffice it to say, what you end up having is the sun's interplanetary magnetic field, or IMF, now connects to the Earth's magnetic field. So after this point of reconnection, you have the solar wind magnetic field pulling Earth's magnetic field from the day side backwards into a stretched magneto tail. And eventually, after enough of these field lines are brought into the tail, there is enough of a load and pressure that you cause reconnection on the night side. And that's when now the Earth's magnetic field lines go from being open and attached to the solar wind to being closed, which means they both have a foot point into Earth's ionosphere. This forms uh, the plasma sheet. So you now have trapped plasma inside these magnetic field lines, which then come back towards Earth and cycle back to the day side. And that full process is known as the Dungy cycle. Now, when the solar wind is pointing northward, it doesn't mean you can't have a cycle of convection. And this is what that picture would look like. So you can't have the day side connection at the nose because their field lines are pointing in the same direction. But as the solar wind field line gets draped backwards into the tail, it can find a point where it's pointing in the opposite direction as Earth's field and reconnect, and you still do get convection. But these will clearly cause very different patterns in how the magnetosphere ionosphere looks. And this is what I mean by ionosphere. Uh, these magnetic field lines, after they reconnect on the day side, as they're being dragged across into the tail, they are also being dragged across the ionosphere in what's called the polar cap. So the polar cap is this region of open magnetic field lines. And as these field lines get dragged back away from the sun, you end up having a velocity of plasma heading towards the night side. And then when these field lines reconnect in the tail and start heading towards the earth, you still have a uh, now on the night side what will be an equatorward motion, so it's still away from the sun as it's heading, as these field lines are coming towards Earth. But then as they come around back to the day side, you get this convection pattern as it loops back to the day side. So you end up having an ionosphere pattern that looks like this. These are uh, both the direction of the plasma, or you could also think of it as equipotentials. And this is just a very symmetric picture that you would get when you have a southward pointing um, magnetic field from the sun. But as I mentioned, that magnetic field of the sun or IMF can be pointing in all sorts of directions. And there have been a lot of studies that have looked at how the convection pattern changes when the IMF is coming in at an angle. So if you want to read more later, here's a whole bunch of studies. So this figure is from Cousins and Shepard, who used SuperDART radar to measure the speed and direction of the flow pattern from this convection as the field lines are being dragged across the polar cap and into the aurora oval and cycling back. So you can see down here is when you have that negative Z, so southward pointing IMF, and that's when you have your pretty symmetric, nice looking uh, pattern. However, when the magnetic field, the IMF is pointing northward, such as these panels up here, convection starts taking on funny shapes. You have what people often like to call a banana and an orange. 
As you can see, um, the convection cells are, can even expand from the two to three or four, especially when you do have a Y component in the magnetic field that can make all sorts of different shapes. And this talk will not be focusing on this because we'll be focusing on substorms, which occur typically when you have the southward BZ. But I did want to point that out, that large scale convection pattern can greatly change. And that there is a new drive center, Kusia, which is studying how these different um, patterns change even across different hemispheres, so north and south. For instance, when there's a positive BZ and a positive BY, you get this pattern in the northern hemisphere, but you get this pattern in the southern hemisphere. So there's a lot of open questions um, in that field that there is this new center studying. All right, continuing the large scale convection magnetosphere ionosphere coupling. So as these field lines are being draped back and dragged across the polar cap, if you recall from your plasma physics or electrodynamics, you will create an electric field because of V cross V. So if your V is going away from the sun, your magnetic field is pointing out of the plane because it's the Earth's magnetic field, you're going to get an electric field that points in this dawn to dusk direction like this. And what is kind of cool, if, and if you have Kivelson and Russell, you can follow through these calculations um, in their book, but I just wanted to bring it here. If you um, can make some assumptions, you can actually calculate what is that electric field and what is the potential drop across the polar cap because the electric field is potential divided by distance. So if we assume the polar cap is about 0.2 RV wide, and we measure, uh, say, velocity of 330 meters per second and a magnetic field of 62,000 nanotesla, you can calculate the potential drop to be 52 kilovolts across the polar cap. Now, this potential um, ha has to be equal here in the magneto tail, because these are the same field lines that are coming across here that then are mapping to the tail. And the solar wind is also mapping here to the tail. So this picture is showing after reconnection, you have a earthward motion of the plasma. So what would be the electric field across the tail? Well, you take that potential divided by the to the diameter of the tail, which is about uh, 20 RE is the radius, so 40 RE, and you get 0.2 millivolts per meter. And so that is approximately the quiet time convection electric field. Um, but of course, if the solar wind velocity increases, then you're going to increase this background convection electric field as well. And that means you also have plasma moving faster towards Earth. And that will come up in another slide. Um, but first, I wanted to share some slides, particularly for the students that are listening. Uh, these are some slides I use when I've given some lectures on convection, and usually they would be more interactive. So if there's any point where I ask a question and you're watching this later, uh, you can always pause the video and try to answer it yourself before hearing the answer because I personally learn better when I um, try and work things through myself. So anyways, um, what's interesting and really cool to know is that particle trajectories, so electrons and ions, uh, can be defined by the magnetic and electric fields involved. And if you were at Ramon Lopez's talk earlier, he made a good point uh, from a Vasily Yunus paper, which is that the order is part, that as plasma moves, it creates the electric field. But in modeling, if we define the magnetic and electric fields, you can define the particle motion. So the point is they're all interconnected. So the important concept to know for today is this concept of guiding center equations of motion, which means particles will move generally in uh, the way that have been uh, derived by Northrop. So you can definitely check out the greater derivations here. So first of all, we have that convection electric field that we were just talking about on the last slide. And that's going to point in the dawn dusk direction as we were just explaining why that forms. 
uh, due to the convection uh, and the solar wind's interaction with Earth's magnetic field. So one direction that particles move is in the cross product, E cross B. So here's where I would ask students to draw um, how are particles going to move if you have a dawn dusk electric field pointing this way and a magnetic field from Earth pointing out of the board. Right hand rule is really your friend when you're doing these kinds of things. So if you use the right hand rule, you will clearly see that the particles are going to travel towards the sun or towards Earth. Obviously, nature is not this simple. So we have other things involved as well with particle motion. We also have a co-rotation electric field, which develops because of the fact that Earth is rotating. Earth is rotating, it's dragging plasma along with it in the counterclockwise direction. Um, if you want to spend more time looking at this later, here's where I often just kind of derive for students how the velocity is defined by the Earth's rotation speed. And so then what would the electric field look like if the velocity is going in the counterclockwise direction everywhere? Well, that would be pointing towards the Earth. So now how do these particles move thanks to the co-rotation electric field, or, or actually they're the ones maybe creating the co-rotation electric field. Uh, they move in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, so now we have two components of how the particles move, but there's more. Particles also move thanks to a gradient in the magnetic field, and that's from this equation here. So a gradient points in the direction of increase. So at Earth, the magnetic field strength is increasing in the direction of Earth. So that means it's pointing inward as well, similar to the co-rotation electric field. So since the cross product is the direction of the gradient cross the direction of the magnetic field, you will similarly get particles that move in that counterclockwise direction, thanks to the gradient. Now you'll notice in this equation that there's an energy term, mv squared over two. So that means that the more energetic the particle is, the faster it's going to drift. Now you also notice there is a Q term. So the sign of the particle matters here as well. So those are electrons. Ions will actually drift in the opposite direction as the electrons. The last term uh, that only applies to particles that are bouncing up and down a magnetic field line, not the particles that are trapped just here at the equator, is the curvature drift. And so also the, it's also uh, the radius of curvature across magnetic field. So that direction is also going to be in this uh, counterclockwise direction for electrons. OK, so I just wanted to then say, once you add all of these different terms, how do the particles move? How does convection work? Here's again where I would have students come to the board and, and try and draw this out. But if you add all these, all these terms, we've got Dawn dusk or convection electric field, co rotation, grad B drift. Uh, this is what you get. So, farther away from Earth, the dawn dusk or convection electric field is the strongest term. It doesn't, there's not a really strong gradient yet in the magnetic field. You don't sense the co rotation electric field. So, they're just going to be puttering in towards the Earth, towards the sun. But as they approach Earth, that gradient in the magnetic field becomes stronger. And they, they start to drift around the Earth, and they cannot access this inside. So the point where the, uh, the boundary where particles are convecting versus being trapped inside is called the alphane layer, or the separatrix. And inside, they're trapped, just grad B drifting or um, being affected by that co-rotation electric field. So here's a question I also like to ask students. So that was for the electrons, right? Which plot below represents the ion motion in the ion alpha layer? Remembering that uh, there's a Q term, so the ions drift in the opposite direction. Now, it's kind of a trick question, because if you only think about the Q term, you'll answer the left side, which isn't wrong. <clears throat> 
As the ions come in, they start to gradually drift in the opposite direction and go around the Earth. But you also have to remember this energy term. So if there's no, if the ion has zero energy or very low energy, it's cold, then this V drift is going to be very small in comparison to uh, convection and co-rotation. So actually cold ions will drift in a similar pattern as the hot electrons. But then how do the particles get past this alpha layer? Are they forever uh, fated to be convecting and only escape out the plasma pods? Or can they find their friends inside this trapped region? And the answer is yes. Um, at least in terms of convection, I'll let others in this theory discuss other aspects. But again, if you remember when I said how you increase the speed of the solar wind, you'll increase this convection electric field. So that term is going to increase. And that means that these particles can actually uh, get in deeper thanks to the squeezing of this alphane layer. Because now that dawn dusk electric field component is stronger than the grad B uh, component until this point. Uh, but then what about a more localized method? And this is what we're going to be talking about more with substorms. And that can occur when you have a localized, really fast flow. So instead of an increased flow everywhere, localized, you can have an enhanced electric field across this localized region which allows particles to just penetrate inside here uh, in a localized manner. And then when that flow disappears, that electric field disappears, they'll be trapped inside. And this is also called particle injection. All right, so that ends the broad overview of the global convection pattern. So let's move to convection on mesoscales. These are embedded in the background convection pattern. Mesoscale phenomena carry the bulk of the load. Angelopoulos et al. showed that bursty bulk flows transport more than 60% of the magnetic flux earthward on the night side. Bursty bulk flows are more than 10 minutes long of enhanced flow with bursts exceeding 400 meters per second. And um, mesoscale phenomena start at the beginning with dayside reconnection. So we'll continue our dayside to nightside story. And just for the sake of definitions, mesoscales in the magnetosphere are considered one to several RE wide. But in the ionosphere, these are about 50 to 500 kilometers wide. Although I have seen some definitions go as low as 30 and as high as 1,000 for the ionosphere. All right, so convections on mesoscale. Uh, Ying Zhou showed more of these items on her series on day side reconnection. So check out her talk for more. But I did want to touch on it for the sake of convection. So when you have transient magnetopause reconnection here on the day side, uh, that creates a flux transfer event. So you have these mesoscale uh, flux, FT, what's called FTE or flux transfer event, moving then anti sunward and across the polar cap. And these uh, create strong mesoscale flows, which you can see here from this super darn um, pattern, which is superimposed on top of the large scale background convection pattern. And associated with these events have been some auroral forms and uh, mesoscales, such as polar and moving auroral forms, uh, known as PMAPs, observed here uh, from the image FUV instrument. So here is a nice image modified from Lyons et al. who summarized a lot of these mesoscale auroral forms that start here on the day side, um, occur in the polar cap and in the night side auroral oval. And this figure is from Nishimura et al., who studied these mesoscale auroral forms as they began on the day side and convected across the polar cap into the night side. So first, uh, let me explain this figure. In the x-axis is time, and in the y-axis is magnetic latitude. So you have to think of this as an instrument that is looking along one line of longitude. So 
anything that you see moving in time, say up, means that it, something is moving poleward. And something that's moving down is moving equatorward. So on the day side, we have this poleward moving air glow patch. It's moving away from the sun. Uh, on the same time, you have day side brightening, this uh, poleward moving auroral form. And also at the same time, this is super darn data. You see this black color, it means that there's anti-sunward flows. So you have all these things pointing towards something moving away from the sun. Now, as we cross into the night side, as you see this uh, air glow patch moving from northern to southern latitudes, that's because we've crossed the northern pole. So now something moving equatorward is moving away from the sun still. And we get even farther down, and this super darn uh, station is again showing equatorward motion of a very fast flow moving here until it reaches the uh, polar cap boundary. So PBI stands for um, the polar cap boundary intensification, which you have an aurora brightening here on the boundary between the polar cap and the auroral oval. And these have been also correlated with auroral streamers, uh, which are these mesoscale auroral forms that travel from northern latitudes towards the equator in southern latitudes. So this is all just showing examples of mesoscale uh, auroral forms that show uh, mesoscale convection as well. So specifically looking at the convection, here's a study we did with uh, using SuperDARN again. And the red color shows the equatorward flow of this mesoscale convection pattern. And when you plot this on top of all sky imagers, you can see here is the equatorward flow. Here is the auroral streamer that's heading equatorward. And here is a continued equatorward flow down here. So in the polar cap, uh, what we found was that during some storms, there were actually fewer uh, mesoscale flows than during quiet time. And this, was, this actually correlates to polar cap arcs which uh, were essentially, therefore, these polar cap arcs, so these mesoscale arcs across the polar cap, their formation is actually still debated. I was looking into this um, recently and was uh, surprised to find out that, although some people would suggest that they are on open field lines, that they actually might map to the plasma sheet. But the, the plasma sheet in the polar cap, how does that work? Well, apparently when you do have these strong VY from the IMF, it can twist the tail such that you end up having this formation that allows uh, an arc to form between the, the polar, or sorry, the plasma sheet uh, like this, or even you can create this, what's called a bifurcated plasma sheet uh, where you have not just a plasma sheet at the equator, but also across north and south and create this uh, polar cap arc like this. And since this talk isn't about polar cap arcs, I do recommend, if you're really curious, uh, check out this review paper by Hosokawa et al. 2020. And there's a lot of great reference material there. So continuing polar cap convection, uh, we did look at these mesoscale flows statistically and uh, did find, as I mentioned, more, or I didn't mention yet actually, but there were more post-midnight flows during positive BY, as you can see here, uh, than during the negative BY. But that's also similar to these polar cap arcs that we talked about. Um, we also found that they generally tilt east to west and that they generally uh, kind of follow this background convection pattern. So as you can see, when you do have that positive BY, that background convection pattern is largely taking place on this post-midnight sector here. So post-midnight, sorry for any students, not clear. That's on this side of Earth where here's midnight straight here and the sun is up here, whereas pre-midnight is uh, right on this side. 
So this just shows that uh, mesoscale flows tend to occur along with how the background flow occurs. All right, so moving now to substorms. Uh, substorms come in several phases. First, there's the growth phase, such as this here in the movie, you see tail stretching, you see flux loading the tail, solar wind energy is stored in the magnetosphere. Uh, you then have the expansion phase, which is when all of that loading unloads. And there's a release of pent up energy, as you just saw. And then following that release of pent up energy, you have the recovery phase as the magnetosphere returns to ground state. The duration of a typical substorm is about 90 minutes. So let's watch that video one more time, just because I really like videos to help explain things. So here we have that southward pointing IMF that reconnected with dayside magnetic field lines from the Earth. It's draping back those magnetic field lines into the tail, causing a very um, stretched tail, very thin current sheet. Um, here's reconnection in the tail and energy release as particles are being deposited into the ionosphere to create this beautiful aurora. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the, what I would call now the three main timing sequences of substorms. Um, although this isn't the main point of my talk, I do want to mention, and maybe others <laughs> will go into this um, in, in later talks. Uh, but the three timing sequences proposed, first of all, is the near-Earth neutral line. And that is basically captured by the movie you just saw, which you have tail stretching, additional load, and then reconnection occurring around 20 to 30 RE. So you always have this distant tail X line in the quiet background, steady state convection picture. But then when you have the substorm, you would have closer to earth at 20 to 30 RE, this enhanced load and then reconnection and when that reconnection occurs, you get this complete reconfiguration of the magneto tail. Uh, you have uh, plasmoid going down the tail. You have uh, flux transfer towards the Earth, dipolarization. And then during the recovery phase, this uh, fills back out. So the current disruption model uh, would say that, you, yes, you have that tail stretching that's occurring, but then that creates a thin current sheet around 9 to 12 RE, and it's so thin that an instability forms. And when that instability forms, current is diverted along the field lines into the ionosphere, and that creates a substorm current wedge, which I'll, I'll tell you what that is in a moment. But then dipolarization forms, and that could trigger reconnection in earthward flows from the 20 RE then. So similar, it's just a, it's a different order. And then we have a more recent uh, suggestion, which uh, I call streamer, or we call streamer triggered substorm. And so this idea is that you have a flow that forms from this distant X line, and that travels earthward, uh, observed optically as a streamer in the ionosphere. And that reaches that very thin, unstable current sheet near 9 to 12 RE, which then sets off the instability, which results in a substorm. And uh, I would recommend uh, McFerrin et al. 2020 has kind of a nice review of that if you're interested. All right, so I think it's important, especially for students to understand how do we observe substorms? Like what, what do we, what does a satellite see in space so that they can understand all these strange wiggly lines? Now, uh, First of all, we've been talking about this tail stretching before the onset. And so when that occurs, you will have a BX component that increases in strength. That's this blue color here. And you can see from the diagram why that's the case. When you have a stretched magneto tail, most of the mag magnetic field component is in the X direction. But then you will, when it goes off, you're going to have dipolarization. So the magnetic field is mostly in the Z direction at that point. And that's what we see here in this red uh, color. You're going to have those fast flows. So X component is going to be uh, positive. 
and that's the blue here of the velocity. Uh, magnetic indices are going to go up, observed from the ground. You're going to see enhanced electric fields in the dawn dusk direction, as we've discussed. You'll sometimes see density depletions in the plasma. And you'll observe particle injections or particle heating. So this is energy flux, and the color is showing that particle energy flux increases. Um, I did give a tutorial on dipolarization specifically for GEM. So if you want more details, um, you can check out this link. Just don't have time today to go into more. All right, so continuing convection on mesoscale. Again, I'm not going to talk about reconnection. You can listen to Jim Drake in October about that. But after reconnection occurs, you end up having this imbalance of the curvature force thanks to this stretched magnetic field line and the pressure force thanks to the dipole magnetic field at Earth. So first, the, the curvature force is going to be pushing those magnetic field lines towards the Earth Oops. until the pressure force is equal and basically causes these field lines to break. And that's what we observe here in statistics um, by Lou et al. You first see these magnetic field lines increasing in speed or accelerating until about 15 RE, and then they decelerate as they approach Earth as they break. Um, another term to be familiar with is uh, the thinking about magnetotail transients in terms of entropy or entropy bubbles. So when these uh, stretched magnetic field lines are cut, they, their volume suddenly decreases, as you can see. And entropy is defined by pressure times volume to five over, third, five over three. And so just like above an air bubble in the water must move to the surface, an entropy bubble must move towards Earth until it reaches a point where the entropy is equivalent. So um, there's been lots of studies about these plasma bubbles um, and how they might penetrate closer to Earth, causing those injections. And one suggestion being the more stretched the tail is prior to this bubble formation, the farther in it's going to reach because it's going to have an even smaller entropy than before. All right, so magnetic flux transport, uh, as we mentioned, most of it is carried in bursty bulk flows. And then within bursty bulk flows, most of the flux transport occurs within these dipolarizing flux bundles. So here's a picture of what a dipolarizing flux bundle looks like as it's propagating earthward. It's crossing the five different themisatellites. So you can see this sharp increase in VZ. It's um, localized in Y and X as it's traveling earthward until it reaches the more dipolar region. And within each of these uh, fast flows of the bursty bulk flow, you see here uh, enhanced electric field EY and uh, overall flux transport, as Lou et al. shows here. And most of the magnetic flux transport occurs during the substrum expansion phase, which we see uh, from this nice figure of Kissinger et al. Here's substrum growth phase. Um, the red colors represent the magnetic flux transport, and you see most of that occurring here in the expansion phase. So that makes sense. After onset, you have a whole bunch of flows bringing in magnetic flux. Um, so here's a new paper from uh, Bern et al., and Yaka might talk more about this next week. But they showed that the total flux transported by about seven separate dipolarization fronts can account for the total magnetic flux that needs to be transported throughout the substorm. Um, next, we have another study that showed similarly that multiple mesoscale dipolarizing flux bundles can bring in the required flux. Um, so here, the concept that I want to talk about is magnetic flux pileup. So if these come in faster than this magnetic flux can dissipate around the Earth, you end up having what's called magnetic flux pileup, um, where this cartoon is taken from our 2019 paper just to show you how that can look. But then here's a nice movie and I'll, I'll, by Merkin et al. It came out last year. And I'll point you to uh, the top panel here, VX. So the red is showing earthward flows. 
the bottom right hand panel BZ is showing the magnetic flux. So pay attention to those two panels. So you can see multiple flow channels coming in. And as those flow channels are coming in, you can see the magnetic flux is also being transported in and is starting to pile up here. And this can be observed as a, as a dipolarization or enhanced BZ. Um, kind of a, as a side, but I thought it was cool. When you have this flux pileup, the flows can be diverted quite into the, the Y direction. And a study that came out by Lou et al. in 2018 showed that these diverted flows can actually cause uh, these omega bands, which is a uh, aurora that has the shape of the Greek letter omega um, in the post-midnight sector. So that was kind of cool. All right, so I mentioned the substorm current wedge. So when you have a flux pileup like that, or a dipolarization, that causes the current to be diverted into the ionosphere like this. So you will observe enhanced current across in the east to west direction in the ionosphere, and then it closes by coming back out um, to the tail. Now, uh, as far as the different substorm theories go, uh, this would be the near-Earth neutral line uh, interpretation of how the substorm current wedge forms. Um, for the current disruption perspective, the current would actually be disrupted first, thanks to that thinning here. So the current would be diverted into the ionosphere and come out, which would then create that dipolarization, which expands um, tailward. And just for a little more info on what the current wedge does and looks like, and again, maybe you'll hear more details from Joachim next week. Uh, here is just an example of, you can see when that current gets diverted in the east to west direction in the ionosphere, here's it coming out of the board is pointing in the west direction now. So this current is going to create a magnetic field, which thanks to our right hand rule, we see is going to be circling in this direction. So if you have a magnetometer on the ground, you can observe this. And this is actually how we usually um, measure or determine if a substorm happened because you see uh, changes in the magnetic field on the ground. And so you can see if your mag magnetometer is north, you're going to have a positive Z component of the magnetic field, which we see here in this plot. Uh, positive BZ. If it's south, you're going to have a, a negative Z component, which we see down here. So that means we know that this is basically above this station because you see a shift it's in the north and the south component. And if you're right below it, you're going to see a very strong H component, which is what we see right at this station as well. And so these indices are compiled into um, AE and AL, if you've heard those terms. And so I'm ending the substorm overview on a figure that many people start on, which is the Akasofu. And uh, Claire Watts showed this before too, which I just had to show again, because it's pretty amazing that Akasofu basically sat outside in the cold Alaska weather and watched the aurora over and over again in order to draw by hand what the aurora looks like during the substorm. So from the auroral perspective, you have this equatorward moving auroral form, which then brightens and then explodes, explodes poleward and westward into what's called this westward traveling surge. And here's a movie uh, that I created. So you have, oh, there it is, it's very fast, um, that explosive process. So let's slow that down a little bit. You've got this uh, equatorward moving auroral form that then brightens, it's now exploding, traveling poleward and westward. And this is generally what you're gonna see when you have this beautiful substorm occur. All right, so taking this down to the ionosphere, because this whole talk has been talking about convection in both 
the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. When you have these fast flows in the magneto tail, they will actually, or can, I should say, map to the ionosphere as what we call an auroral streamer. Um, so as this is moving earthward, that streamer is going to be moving equatorward. So we can also monitor this from the ground as well as from space. Although a caveat points out, McFerrin found that not every flow burst is associated with a streamer. So why do these streamers form? Well, when you have this earthward flow coming in, it creates these flow vortices, and that creates a flow shear. And this flow shear creates a field aligned current, which travels down to the ionosphere, closes and come back out. Not totally unlike that substorm current wedge shape, but now much smaller and traveling with that flow. So here's a gorgeous uh, figure from Gallardo Laporte et al. That showed again the super darn data. So red means equatorward flow, blue means poleward flow, and right at the transition or at the flow shear, you see this gorgeous mesoscale streamer in each of these figures. And um, there's a lot of papers here or more that you can read more about streamers. Uh, and I also want to point out that clearly we've shown how the magnetosphere can affect the ionosphere. But the ionosphere can also affect the magnetosphere. And for just a couple examples, uh, here's a paper by Bolidu et al. who showed that a shielding electric field increases uh, where conductance is lower. So you have enhanced conductance gradients thanks to precipitation or aurora over here. But then here it, uh, where the gradients are high, that basically slows down convection. And so, then Chief King Wong made this paper showing that where he starts a flow burst or a bubble in his simulation determines whether or not that flow burst or bubble can make it in. And so uh, for strong convection over here, it could not make it in because E cross B is so strong. However, where it was weaker, the flow bubble and the weaker on the pre midnight sector um, here the bubble was able to reach in more deeply. So the point is just uh, MI coupling is very important. Um, Bill Lotko showed this at all, as well in a science paper, um, how can conductivity gradients can affect reconnection flows. Um, also higher conductivity can slow flows. We found that with our mesoscale flow, flows, uh, they're faster in the summer and slower in the winter. So we hypothesized that because there's higher conductivity in the winter side, thanks to an increased precipitation, that could be slowing down those flows. So again, just lots of feedback going on. All right, before I wrap up, uh, I've talked a lot about magnetic flux transport. I wanted to talk a bit about plasma and particle transport. So here's a figure from Kramer et al. showing that pretty much all of the plasma transport is due to these mesoscale bubbles. Here's another figure by Kesey et al. This is from her GEM 2020 presentation, although you can read her 2014 paper to learn more, where she has used twins data to uh, make 2D maps of the ion temperature in the magneto tail, which is pretty cool, and then compared that with MMS data. So you can see these mesoscale hot ion regions um, from plasma flows, which MMS measured here, the, the fast flows and um, increased particles. So there are really cool questions you can answer with using these kinds of techniques as well. Then for particle transport, particle injections, um, as Kyle mentioned, this was my thesis, so I couldn't not talk about them. Uh, Basically, injections are observed when you see those enhanced uh, energy fluxes or fluxes of particles across multiple energy channels. Uh, so this is what you see when you break those uh, spectrogram down into line plots. And injections are talking about when the particles are being inserted past um, that alphane layer so that they can fill this trapped region. And we observe the injection boundary traveling both earthward as well as away from the Earth. Um, which can occur due to that dipolarization that's um, 
moving tailward as well as earthward. And there's way more I could say about this, but I don't have time. So bringing in those particle trajectory discussions we had at the beginning, um, I like to show this, especially for students, to help understand how those particles move under different electric and magnetic fields and for different energies. So the left-hand column is a low energy particle, 0.1 keV. We have 10 keV particles in the middle and 100 keV particles so more energetic on the right, on the right side. Uh, the top is plotting the magnetic field and the bottom is plotting the electric field for this mesoscale flow. And you can see the low energy particles, they E cross B drift, so they can come all the way in just from um, E cross B. Your more energetic particles, they start to be affected by these local gradients in the magnetic field that from this flux being transported in. And the more e even energetic ones are really affected by these local gradients in the magnetic field. So these guys, these guys are not able to come in. Um, but what we did is we said, well, hey, the, what if we shrunk the x direction of this flux transport, which may be more uh, similar to data. So now these are small magnetic field islands or small flux bundles that are each coming in one flow burst. And because they're localized, not just in Y, but also in X, even these energetic electrons are trapped, grad B drifting around these peaks in magnetic field. So they're actually able to come in and travel a very large distance without drifting out of the picture because they're trapped around this local enhancement. And then explains questions that people have like, well, how can energetic particles become all the way in from reconnection or um, how can they gain so much energy if the only energy they're gaining is by grad B drifting across this electric field? Well, as this localized BZ increases, they also gain energy from DBDT, which um, can bring them up to an, uh, injection energy levels. So this was also shown in uh, these MHD simulations. So the one on the left by Eschetu et al. is for electrons. The one on the right by Korsky et al. is for ions. And you're going to see the same thing where the particles are trapped um, along, traveling along with these local enhancements in BZ, these magnetic field islands. And so thanks to the fact that these are mesoscale, that they are only a couple RE wide at most, these energetic particles can be carried in deeper than was what previously thought. Um, but whereas uh, our simple model in the previous slide just talked about adiabatic energy gain, these models both show, suggest that energization can be non-adiabatic. Um, I apologize for the students, I didn't have time to discuss adiabatic versus non-adiabatic, uh, but hopefully you'll learn about those in your plasma classes. All right, so to conclude, just some recent work in looking forward. Um, this talk focused more on IMF negative BZ because of the substorm focus, but IMF positive BZ and IMF BY causes a lot of interesting things too and causes interhemispheric asymmetries which open many questions. I hope that you did take away the fact that mesoscale convection is very important, especially when discussing substorms. And I hope you come, if you're interested, next week, Jakob Byrne will talk more about this. So we're working on quantifying their contribution. We as in the field who are studying this. Um, some new, hot pa new papers that are hot off the press. If you're interested, check out our GEM focus group. Um, here's a link. We've been collecting uh, papers that have to do with this. So you can read a lot more. Um, we want to quantify contributions to the radiation belts and ring currents. I believe in two weeks, Drew Turner will be talking about radiation belts, so tune in for that. And then I hope you also took away there are vast implications on the ionosphere, thermosphere, and meso mesosphere. So there's a gem focus group on that. You can check out more at this link. Um, global models are now computationally capable of including mesoscales. So that makes it even more important to get more observations so that we can inform these models. Um, 
And then I also just want to repeat other speakers' previous calls for multi-point observations to help inform the models. It'd be great to have uh, more satellites spread in azimuth or MLT and radial distance. Um, it would be great to observe the aurora, the precipitation simultaneously to the in situ particle data to help with that MI coupling understanding. And then to coordinate with improving modeling efforts that include smaller scales. Um, so for this mesoscale issue, there is also a focus group um, that is focusing on multi-spacecraft and ground-based observations, and you can visit that at this link here. All right, so I'm going to conclude. Um, Sorry, this is kind of like very broad, so all over, all, we covered a lot of material, um, but I'll answer any questions if I'm able. Thank you. All right, thank you, Christine. That was a really wonderful talk. It was really clear and really well organized, especially with reference to our past and future seminars. Um, and I really appreciate that. So thank you again for a wonderful talk. Sure. Um, we do have about five or six questions uh, that you and I can go over now. Okay. Our first one comes from Chandra Krishna, and it is, what are the physical characteristics of dipolarization? Could you discuss a few of these in a little bit more detail? Oh, yeah. So I, first let me say, Chandra, if you, once this talk is uploaded, um, there was that link to my talk on dipolarizations at GEM, and that will give you way more information than I can talk about here. So please check that out. But also, um, what other characteristics? Yeah, it's, there's so much, so I'll try to... Uh, the main characteristic is enhanced BZ. That's what you'll observe, so an increase in the BZ component. But basically what dipolarization means is you go from a very stretched magneto tail to a, a more dipolar one. That's why it's called dipolarization. And so um, there are actually these mesoscale dipolarizations that we saw, which are just a few RE wide and are traveling with that fast flow. And so along with that, um, I don't know if this question was asked before I showed that data plot, but along with that, you're going to see that enhanced plasma flow towards the Earth, enhanced uh, electric field in the y direction, you'll see enhanced uh, particle flux, um, and then you also have this large-scale dipolarization, which is multiple MLT wide, and that's a more classical dipolarization because that's a reconfiguration of the entire magneto tail, um, and that, that has also been associated with, with injections, particle enhancements, um, yeah, there's so much. I, I hope that kind of helped and maybe you can check out that, that talk or check out that data slide that was in this talk to help answer it more too. Perfect, thanks. Um, on that note, the talk will be uploaded later today uh, and I'll try and parse out most of the links that you've provided on this slide into the blog post, which will also be up later today. Uh, the second question comes from Witham Reed. Witham Reeve, what are the magnetic signatures of substorms in ground-based magnetometers? Yeah. And particularly, magnetometers on the equator edge of the global. Is there any evidence for quasi-periodic variations with one to three hour characteristic timescales in these observations? All right, so I'm not sure here, if the question, here, here is the slide that kind of discussed what that looks like. Um, so, how, what it looks like on the ground, as I was explaining, depends on where you're located. So, if you're talking, he's interested in the uh, equatorward side. Yeah. Um, so, that would be on this side, generally, because uh, here's the equatorward side. So, you would see um, a negative Z component in the ground magnetometer. So that would be like these stations down here, like uh, Yornia here is uh, equatorward. So you see a negative Z component. Um, and if you're far from this current wedge current, you won't see that much um, H component change, but you might see a little bit. So like here, you do see a little deviation in the H component. Um, and as far as quasi-periodic variations, 
uh, with one to three hour characteristic time. I, is he, he or she talking about sawtooth events perhaps? Um, so there are these events called sawtooth events, which is kind of debated, I guess, whether or not it's a thing, um, but it's definitely seen in the data where you have injections, which come in on a, a regular periodicity. Um, it's kind of like the magnetosphere got into some kind of feedback loop. So they are coming in on these types of periodicities. And although I haven't looked at the ground-based uh, data, I would assume that with each of these injections coming in on those periodicities, you would see that in the magnetometer. Great, thanks. So our next question comes from Charles Chappelle. In the Dungy cycle, if the magnetic field lines from the Earth merge with the solar wind magnetic field and the connected field line is swept tailward across the polar cap to reemerge in the tail, why don't we see solar wind particles in the lobes of the tail? Um. So this, to be quite honest, is not my area of research. So unfortunately, anything I say would just, would be a guess um, because I haven't actually studied that. Um, in fact, I didn't know that you couldn't see solar wind particles in the lobes at all. Uh, but I think my assumption would be as you have the um, ionospheric polar wind outflow that would, all travel, then it would basically escape down the magnetic field line. So from my understanding is you don't see that much precipitation in the polar cap because the particles are escaping along the magnetic field lines out the, um, into the solar wind. So it doesn't, it kind of makes sense to me, I guess, that it would be somewhat evacuated um, as so those particles are traveling out. Sorry, I can be a little more helpful. I think that, no, that, I think that answers it quite well. Um, our next question comes from Chunali. What is the main difference between storm time substorms and isolated substorms in terms of enhancement of different ions? In terms of enhancement of different ions. I, I, Other than just the fact that you get more ions, more um, ring current development during a storm, um, I'm, I'm not I'm not sh quite sure how to answer. Because uh, an isolated substorm, as we discussed, is about 90 minutes long, and it'll just kind of throw in a, some ions into the inner magnetosphere. Whereas during a storm, uh, you get a lot of um, injection of of ions into the inner magnetosphere, um, and then the development of this ring current, which is um, how you can measure how strong a storm is. Um, storm time substorm, so that's also a debate actually, whether or not the storm is comprised of multiple substorms or if it's completely its own beast. Um, and I've heard people talk confidently in both directions. Uh, so again, sorry, may, I don't know if that was helpful. Uh, no, I think that's quite helpful. I would agree with you, it's an ongoing discussion and we've even organized sessions together at GEM to discuss it, so. Yeah. Um, so Antonova asks, is it possible to observe the mesoscale ionospheric flow, or flow vortexes inside the Aurora oval, um, things associated maybe with staci stationary inverted Vs with radar observations? Um, well, if I understand the question correctly, yes, we do definitely observe the flow vortices um, with the super darn data. The figure I showed from Diardo Lacorte et al. showed that quite nicely. Um, where you, I don't know if I can get back there and talk, if I even already did it. Well, anyway, you saw that um, red, that red super darn color uh, right next to the blue, which showed the, um, here we go, the flow shear. 
So this is that, that vortice here where you've got equatorward flow and then you've got tailward flow right next to it. Um, and then as far as inverted V structures, um, yeah, I guess if, if you were to fly a DMSP satellite over this, then you would see the, an inverted V um, over where you see this equatorward flow. Or sorry, over where you see this uh, streamer. Cool. Uh, so we have two more questions. Uh, the second mast is from Eric Lund. Uh, what is the typical scale size in the y direction of the incoming flux bundles? Yeah, so that's going to be anywhere from just under one RE to uh, several RE wide. Cool. And so our last question comes from Judy Carpin. Why is the inner current sheet at about nine to twelve RE so thin? As the other, as the outer tail retracts, it seems that the inner current sheet would get thicker and shorter due to the inward pressure? Um, hmm. Well, the 9 to 12 RE region, which we refer to as the transition region, is basically that place where the Earth's field goes from a more dipolar shape, I don't know if my fingers are showing up, to the stretched field farther out into the tail. Um, so it's not thin, I guess, until you get that, that loading that then kind of throws things off. Um, I, but then it, it, I always just assume it's because you have that extreme change from being more dipolar to more uh, thin all of a sudden. But I actually, I don't think I have a really good answer either um, as to why that's the specific region versus, yeah, I'm sorry, I'd have to think about that or talk to some more people. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I must admit when I read it, I was intrigued by it as well. <laughs> I feel like I should know the answer, so I feel a little bad, but I hadn't really thought about it in those terms before. Um, so that brings us to the end today. Uh, I want to thank you again for a really great seminar. Uh, next week, as Christine has mentioned, we have Joachim Byrne, and he'll be talking more about the dynamic magneto tail with a focus on substorms. And that will be next Monday. Uh, the following Monday is a holiday, so we won't have any seminar then. And then Drew Turner will follow up with the inner, with a beginning in the inner magnetosphere and radiation belts. So thank you again, Christine, for a wonderful talk. Um, as you've mentioned, I hope to have these slides uploaded later today so that everyone can check um, on all the references that you provided everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle.